Welcome back. In this video, you'll learn about slope and tangent lines of polar curves. Let's get to it. All right, so over the last couple lessons, I've introduced you to the polar coordinate system where we learned how to plot points, use polar equations, and graph those polar equations, as well as how to convert between the polar coordinate system and the rectangular coordinate system. And so now you should be pretty familiar with the polar coordinate system, and so we're ready to begin to use calculus for polar equations and polar graphs. And we're going to start by finding the slope and special types of tangent lines for polar graphs using the derivative. And so if you take a look at this graph right here, here I have a polar graph, specifically a cardioid. Let's say that we wanted to find the slope at a particular point along that curve. How could we find the slope at that point? Well, it might seem a little difficult at first because a polar graph, which is represented by a polar equation, is in terms of r and theta. But the slope or the derivative will be in terms of x and y, right? dy dx. The definition of slope is the change in y divided by the change in x. And so if we were to look at the slope of the tangent line at this point along this curve, it wouldn't make sense for the slope to be represented in terms of r and theta. This tangent line is still going to have a slope, which is a change in y divided by a change in x. All right, we still need to find the derivative dy dx. And so how can we find the slope or the derivative dy dx for a point along a polar graph? Well, what we can do, instead of representing our polar graph with a polar equation in terms of r and theta, we can represent this polar graph with two equations that would form a pair of parametric equations. And to do that, we're going to use two of our conversion formulas that we use to convert between polar coordinates and rectangular coordinates and vice versa. And those two equations look like this. X is equal to r times cosine theta and y is equal to r times sine theta. All right, these two equations represent x and y in terms of r and theta. Now these two equations in their current state are not a pair of parametric equations because both x and y are in terms of two variables, right? We don't have just one parameter, we have r and theta. So what we wanna do is rewrite these two equations such that x and y are defined with one variable, one parameter. And all we have to do to make that the case is to replace r with what it's equal to. r is equal to some function in terms of theta, right? This is the polar equation that represents this polar graph. We can replace r in these two equations with f of theta, a function in terms of theta, and then both x and y will be equal to some expression in terms of theta. We will have a pair of parametric equations where the parameter is theta. So if we do that, we'll have x is equal to f of theta times cosine theta, and y is equal to f of theta times sine theta. And now the reason why this is helpful, the reason why we want these two parametric equations is because now, since these two equations will represent this polar graph, and we wanna find the derivative or the slope at a point for this graph, we can use the form of a parametric derivative to find that slope. And so if you're not familiar with parametric equations and parametric derivatives, I would recommend that you watch my videos on those topics first. But if you are familiar with parametric equations and parametric derivatives, then you might remember that the form of a parametric derivative looks like this. We know that dy dx, the derivative, is equal to the derivative of the parametric equation for y with respect to the parameter, which in this case is theta, divided by the derivative of our equation for x with respect to the parameter theta. All right, so dy dx, the derivative, is equal to the derivative of y with respect to theta divided by the derivative of x with respect to theta. So all we have to do to find the derivative or the slope at a point along a polar curve is to set up this form of a parametric derivative. So let's find it. Let's take the derivative of x and y with respect to theta and then use those two derivatives to set up our parametric derivative. So if we start with our equation for x, x is equal to f of theta times cosine theta. Note that if we're going to take the derivative of this expression, that we're going to need to use the product rule, right? We have a function in terms of theta times another function in terms of theta, f of theta times cosine theta. And so we are going to need to use the product rule. And so if you don't remember the product rule, I'll have it up here on the screen for you to reference. But here's how it works. 
dx d theta, or the derivative of x with respect to theta, will be equal to the first function, f of theta, times the derivative of the second function. And the derivative of cosine is negative sine. So this is equal to f of theta times negative sine theta. All right, then we're going to add that to the second function, cosine theta times the derivative of the first function. So we'll have cosine theta times f prime of theta. Right, the derivative of f of theta will be f prime of theta. So this is dx d theta right here. That is the derivative of x with respect to the parameter theta. So if we simplify this a little bit, this negative from sine theta will come out to the front and make this whole term negative. And so I'm gonna reorder the terms. So we have our positive term first, and then we'll subtract this term. So we'll have that dx d theta is equal to f prime of theta times cosine theta minus f of theta times sine theta. All right, so I just reordered our terms and reordered the multiplication of these two parts. So we have f prime of theta times cosine theta, and we're subtracting this term since we have negative sine theta times f of theta. So now we have minus f of theta times sine theta. All right, so this is dx d theta. Now let's find dy d theta. dy d theta, or the derivative of y with respect to theta, will be equal to the derivative of f of theta times sine theta, which once again is going to require the product rule. We're going to multiply the first function times the derivative of the second. And so we're going to have f of theta times the derivative of sine, which is cosine. So we'll have f of theta times cosine theta. And then we're going to add that to the second function, sine theta times the derivative of the first function. So we'll have sine theta times f prime of theta. All right, now I'm going to reorder these terms and reorder the multiplication of these two parts so that it more closely matches the form of dx d theta. I want to have f prime of theta first and then have the term with f of theta. So I'm just going to reorder these terms and we'll have that dy d theta is equal to f prime of theta times sine theta and that will be added to f of theta times cosine theta. Okay, so now we have dy d theta which means now we have both dx d theta and dy d theta, which we can use to set up our parametric derivative, dy dx. That will represent the derivative or the slope for any point along this polar curve or any other polar curve, as long as we know what f of theta is equal to. And so if we set this up, this derivative will be equal to dy d theta divided by dx d theta. So I'll write dy d theta in the numerator here. We'll have f prime, of theta times sine theta plus f of theta times cosine theta. All right, that's just this derivative right here, dy d theta. I just rewrote that to be right here in the numerator of our parametric derivative, and this will be divided by dx d theta, which is right here. We'll have f prime of theta times cosine theta minus f of theta times sine theta. All right, and so now what we have is the parametric derivative or the derivative in polar form of a polar equation that represents a polar graph that we can use to find the slope at a particular value of theta for that graph or for that polar equation. All right, and so to summarize what we just found, we now know that the slope in polar form looks like this. dy dx, the derivative or the slope, is equal to a parametric derivative, dy d theta divided by dx d theta, which is equal to this expression, f prime of theta times sine theta plus f of theta times cosine theta divided by f prime of theta times cosine theta minus f of theta times sine theta. All right, so now when you find the slope in this form for a polar equation, I recommend that you use this formula right here. If you can try to remember this formula, it's going to be a lot easier to use and you'll be less likely to make a mistake if you use this expression directly rather than setting up your parametric equations and using the product rule to find dy d theta and dx d theta. All right, if you use this expression right off the bat, you kind of skip that extra work of needing to use the product rule and setting up your parametric equations. All you have to do if you use this expression is find f of theta, which is just your polar equation, r equals some function in terms of theta, and then you would also need to find the derivative of that function, and then you just plug the derivative and that function into this expression. All right, it's going to be a lot easier to work with than starting from scratch by setting up those parametric equations.
Okay, so while it's important to realize that that's what's going on here, that dy dx is equal to dy d theta divided by dx d theta, typically I'll leave this part out of the calculation and just say that dy dx is equal to this formula right here. I think it's going to be much easier for you to remember this formula than to set up your parametric equations. Of course, it all comes down to preference in the end. You can really do this whichever way you like, but I'm going to recommend that you use this method so that you make the least amount of mistakes possible. Okay, and so with that, now that you know the slope in polar form, let's take a look at an example of finding the slope of a tangent line for a polar equation. All right, so here's our example. For r equals one plus cosine theta, we wanna find dy dx and the slope of the tangent line at theta equals pi divided by six. All right, so there's two different parts to this problem, but they're both related. We wanna start by finding dy dx, the derivative, for our polar equation, and then we want to evaluate that derivative at theta equals pi divided by six, which will give us the slope of the tangent line at that value of theta. All right, so let's start with the first part. Let's find our derivative dy dx, and you'll see that I have our formula down here for us to reference. And so the first thing that we should do is identify what f of theta is going to be. What is our function in terms of theta? Well, it's pretty easy to find that. It's going to come from our polar equation, whatever r is equal to is going to be your function in terms of theta. So in this case, f of theta is equal to one plus cosine theta, okay? So that's f of theta. And then the only other thing that we need to find this derivative is f prime of theta. We need to calculate the derivative of this function. And so let's do that. That should be pretty easy. The derivative of one is zero and the derivative of cosine is negative sine. So f prime of theta is equal to negative sine theta. Okay, so now we have f of theta and f prime of theta. Now we can plug these two different functions into this formula and have our derivative. So let's do that. We'll have dy dx is equal to f prime of theta, which is negative sine theta. So we'll have negative sine theta times sine theta. So we'll have sine theta and then add that to f of theta, which is one plus cosine theta times cosine theta. So we'll have one plus cosine theta times cosine theta. All right, so that's dy d theta or the numerator of our derivative. Now let's find the denominator or dx d theta and we'll start with f prime of theta times cosine theta. f prime of theta is a negative sine theta. So we'll have negative sine theta times cosine theta. Then we will subtract, right? We have a subtraction sign here f of theta times sine theta, and f of theta is one plus cosine theta. So we'll have one plus cosine theta times sine theta. All right, so this is our derivative, dy dx, at least in its unsimplified form. But what we wanna do next is simplify this so that we don't have to plug this value of theta into this equation in one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight different places. That's gonna be a little bit annoying. So if we can simplify this, we should, that way evaluating our derivative at this value of theta to find our slope isn't as much of an annoying process, right? We wanna to try to make this as easy for us as possible. So let's do some simplification, okay? And so the first thing that we can do to simplify this is multiply each of these quantities together and be careful here. Please don't cross out these quantities like this. You cannot cancel out those quantities. That would be incorrect. In order to do any canceling here, the same value needs to be in all four of these terms. You would need to have the same factor in this term, this term, this term, and this term. If they all have a common factor, then you can cancel that out. But in this case, we do not have any common factors between all of those different terms. These two have negative sine theta, these two have one plus cosine theta, but those quantities are not in all four terms, so we can't cancel them out, all right? So do not make that mistake. The first thing that you should do after you set up your derivative is just multiply everything out. That's going to be the easiest next step. All right, so if we do that, this will be equal to negative sine squared theta. That's just negative sine theta times sine theta. And then let's distribute cosine theta through this quantity. We'll have cosine theta times one plus cosine theta times itself. All right, so we'll have plus cosine theta plus cosine squared theta. And then we'll divide that by negative sine theta times cosine theta, which will be negative sine theta times cosine theta. And then we will subtract sine theta distributed through these two terms. So we'll have sine theta times one and sine theta times cosine theta. 
So we'll have sine theta plus sine theta cosine theta. All right, and it's important to remember those parentheses because we are subtracting both of these terms, right? We're subtracting this quantity times this sine theta. So we need to subtract both of those terms, not just the first one. And so if we distribute that negative through this quantity, we'll have negative sine theta and then negative sine theta cosine theta. So if I erase those parentheses, we can just leave that negative sign right there and then change this plus sign to be a negative sign, okay? Now let's see if there's any like terms that we can combine. First of all, I see in the denominator, we have two negative sine theta cosine thetas, right? We have one here and one here. So we can combine them to be negative two times sine theta cosine theta. But in the numerator, I don't really see anything that we can combine. However, I am going to reorder these terms. And by doing that, I'm going to point out something else that we can do instead in the numerator. All right, so here's what we can do. This derivative will be equal to cosine squared theta minus sine squared theta plus cosine theta. All right, I just reordered these terms in the numerator. I moved this last term to the front. So we have cosine squared theta minus sine squared theta plus cosine theta. All right, that's where each of those terms came from. And then this is going to be divided by that denominator, which like we said, we can combine these two terms and have negative two times sine theta, cosine theta, and then we still have minus sine theta. All right, so now we've simplified it further. And now at this point, if you wanted to, you could plug in theta to evaluate your derivative at that value, but we could still make this easier so we don't have to plug in that angle as many times. We did start with eight thetas in our equation that we had to plug it into. Now we have one, two, three, four, five, six. So that's two less, that's pretty nice, but we can make this even simpler so we only have to plug it in four times. And we can do that by making use of some trigonometric identities. Specifically, there's a trig identity for cosine squared theta minus sine squared theta and two times sine theta cosine theta. That's why I reordered these terms in the numerator because by doing that, we can see that we have cosine squared theta minus sine squared theta, which can be rewritten using a specific trig identity. In particular, that trig identity looks like this. We know that cosine squared theta minus sine squared theta is equal to cosine of two theta, right? This is one of our double angle identities. We can rewrite this complicated expression as just cosine of two theta. And then in a the denominator for two times sine theta cosine theta, the other trig identity that we know is that two times sine theta times cosine theta is equal to sine of two theta. That's another double angle identity that we can use. And if you don't know these two identities, I would encourage you to try to remember these or memorize these because these two identities are going to be used a lot when finding the derivative and the slope of polar equations, all right? You're going to find that these two expressions are pretty common in your work when you're finding the derivative just because of the way the formula is. It already has sine and cosine in the numerator and denominator. And so oftentimes that will lead into these two expressions in some way. Okay, so if you can, try to memorize these two identities if you don't already know them. But let's use these to rewrite this derivative to be even simpler. We're going to replace these two terms, cosine squared theta minus sine squared theta with cosine of two theta. And we're going to replace two sine theta cosine theta with sine of two theta. And don't forget to include that negative when we rewrite this, that negative is not going away. It's not part of this identity. All right, so what we'll have is that this derivative is equal to cosine of two theta plus cosine theta divided by negative sine of two theta minus sine theta. All right, so this is the simplified form of this derivative right here. Now we only have one, two, three, four different thetas that we can plug our angle into. So this simplified form of the derivative is going to make calculating our slope a lot easier. All right, and so now that we have this, let's plug in that value of theta. Okay, so here's our derivative, and if we're going to evaluate it at theta equals pi divided by six, that is going to find the slope of the tangent line at that value of theta for this polar equation. All right, so we'll have dy dx evaluated at theta equals pi divided by six, and that will be equal to cosine of two times pi divided by six plus cosine of pi divided by six divided by negative sine 
of 2 times pi divided by 6 minus sine of pi divided by 6. All right, so we just replaced each of these thetas with pi divided by 6. Now 2 times pi divided by 6, that's going to reduce to be pi divided by 3. So we're going to have pi divided by 3 for this angle and pi divided by 3 for this angle. So I'll continue our work up here. This will be equal to cosine of pi divided by 3 plus cosine of pi divided by 6 divided by negative sine of pi divided by 3 minus sine of pi divided by 6. All right, now cosine of pi divided by 3, that's equal to 1 half. So this is equal to 1 half plus cosine of pi divided by 6. That's equal to the square root of 3 divided by 2. And then in the denominator, we have negative sine of pi divided by 3. Sine of pi divided by 3 is also the square root of 3 divided by 2. But remember that that is negative because we have negative sine of pi divided by 3. And then we will be subtracting sine of pi divided by 6. And sine of pi divided by 6 is 1 half. So we'll have minus 1 half. All right, now before we try to simplify this too much, I want you to notice something pretty interesting here. If we were to pull out the negative sign out of these two terms in the denominator, if we pull that negative out, what we'll have is that this is equal to negative 1 half plus the square root of 3 divided by 2. And then we'll have the positive square root of 3 plus 1 half. All right. So I pulled the negative out of both of these terms, brought it out to the front. So we have the negative right here in front of this fraction. But now notice that the numerator and the denominator are exactly the same, right? We have 1 half plus the square root of 3 divided by 2 and the square root of 3 divided by 2 plus 1 half. It doesn't matter what order we add those two values in, they're going to be the same value. So we have some value divided by itself. 1 half plus the square root of 3 divided by 2 divided by itself. And anything divided by itself is 1. So this is going to be equal to negative 1. So I'll write that. This is equal to negative 1. That is the slope at this value of theta, theta equals pi divided by 6, for this polar equation. Okay, and so that's how you can find dy dx, which by the way is this right here, that's dy dx, and then use that derivative to find the slope of a tangent line at a particular value of theta for a polar equation. All right, and then an application of being able to find the slope or the derivative for a polar equation is the ability to find horizontal and vertical tangent lines. We know that horizontal tangent lines are where the slope is zero and vertical tangent lines are where the slope is undefined. And so in this case, if we look at our derivative down here, this is our polar form of a derivative, the slope is going to be zero when this numerator is equal to zero, right? If this numerator is zero, then zero divided by anything is going to be zero, unless that denominator is zero, but we'll talk about that in a second. In the majority of cases, when the numerator is zero, or when dy d theta is equal to zero, that is going to be the location of a horizontal tangent line. But if the denominator of this derivative is zero, meaning that we would be dividing by zero, that would mean that the value of the slope is undefined, and that is going to be where vertical tangent lines will occur, when dx d theta is equal to zero. All right, so if the denominator is equal to zero, for a particular value of theta, you know that at that value of theta, you have a vertical tangent line. Just like if the numerator is equal to zero for a particular value of theta, you know that there is a horizontal tangent line at that value of theta. All right, and now in both cases, that's provided that both the numerator and the denominator are not equal to zero at the same time, right? That they're not equal to zero at the same value of theta. If that happens, you might have to look at the graph of your polar equation, and that should help you identify what's going on, whether you have a horizontal tangent line, a vertical tangent line, or neither of them. In most cases, you're not gonna have either of them when working with polar equations, and I'll show you what I mean by that in our example problem. Okay, but just be aware that if dy d theta and dx d theta or the numerator and denominator are both equal to zero for the same value of theta, that's possible that you have no idea if you have a horizontal or vertical tangent line, but in most cases, you're just not going to have either of them at all. Okay, so now let's take a look at an example, and this will be the last example for this video, of finding some horizontal and vertical tangent lines for a polar curve. All right, so here's our example. We want to find the points of horizontal and vertical tangency, if any, to the polar curve. All right, and in this case, we have r equals 1 minus sine theta. This is our polar equation that's going to represent our polar curve or our polar graph. And so the first thing that we need to do to find the points of horizontal and vertical tangency 
is to find the derivative or the slope of this polar equation for any particular value of theta, right? So we need to find dy dx before we can do anything else. So let's do that first. First thing that we wanna do is identify f of theta. That's just going to be equal to what r is equal to. r is equal to a function in terms of theta, which is one minus sine theta. And then we need to find the derivative of that f prime of theta. And that will be equal to the derivative of one, which is zero. And then the derivative of negative sine theta, which will be negative cosine theta because the derivative of sine is cosine. So we'll have negative cosine theta for f prime of theta. All right, and so now that we have f of theta and f prime of theta, we can use those two expressions to set up our derivative dy dx. So let's do that. We'll have dy dx is equal to f prime of theta times sine theta. So we'll have negative cosine theta times sine theta. So I'll write that, negative cosine theta, sine theta. And then we're going to add that to f of theta times cosine theta. And f of theta is one minus sine theta. So we'll have one minus sine theta times cosine theta. All right, and then that is divided by f prime of theta times cosine theta. So we'll have negative cosine theta times cosine theta. So I'll write that down, negative cosine theta times cosine theta. And then we are subtracting f of theta times sine theta. So I'll have one minus sine theta times sine theta. So I'll have one minus sine theta times sine theta, okay? So this right here is our derivative dy dx in its unsimplified form. So now let's work on simplifying it and then we will use it to locate any points of horizontal or vertical tangency. All right, and when we simplify this derivative, when you wanna find horizontal and vertical tangent lines, I recommend that you just multiply everything out and then don't use any of your trig identities. I only recommend using trig identities to simplify your derivative when you just wanna evaluate it at a particular value of theta. When you actually wanna solve for values of theta that make the numerator or denominator equal to zero, which is what we're gonna do in this case to find horizontal and vertical tangent lines, it's gonna be easier if you just leave it in its unsimplified state, of course, after multiplying everything out and just ignore using any trig identities. All right, and so let's do that in this case. Let's just multiply everything out. Negative cosine theta times sine theta will give us negative cosine theta, sine theta, and then we'll add this to this quantity times cosine theta. So we'll multiply cosine by both of these terms and we'll have positive cosine theta and then minus sine theta, cosine theta. All right, and then in the denominator, we have negative cosine theta times cosine theta. That will be negative cosine squared theta. And then we are subtracting this quantity times sine theta. So we'll multiply sine by both of those terms and have positive sine theta minus sine squared theta. Okay, now we need to distribute this negative through this quantity and then add our like terms in the numerator. Notice that we have cosine theta times sine theta, which is the same as sine theta times cosine theta, right? We could reorder the multiplication of these parts and these two terms would be the same. So we have negative two times sine theta cosine theta. And so if we combine those two terms and distribute this negative, our derivative will be equal to negative two times cosine theta times sine theta plus cosine theta, and that will be divided by negative cosine squared theta minus sine theta plus sine squared theta, all right? And so this is the form of our derivative that we're going to use to find our points of horizontal and vertical tangency. I'm not going to simplify this any further using any trig identities. It's going to be easier for us to work with this in its current form. All right, and so what we wanna do is set the numerator and the denominator equal to zero separately and solve for values of theta. The values of theta that we get for the numerator are going to tell us where we have horizontal tangent lines and the values of theta where the denominator is equal to zero will tell us where we have vertical tangent lines. All right, so let's work on that. Let's start by looking for some horizontal tangent lines. Horizontal tangent lines occur when the slope is zero or when the numerator is equal to zero. So we'll have zero is equal to negative two times cosine theta times sine theta plus cosine theta. All right, now what we wanna do in this case in order to solve for theta is first pull out a common factor. I see that both of these terms have cosine theta within them, so we can pull that out. We'll have zero is equal to cosine theta times negative two times sine theta 
plus one, right? If we pull cosine theta out of each of these terms, this cosine theta will be removed. So we're just left with negative two times sine theta right here and cosine theta divided by itself is one. All right, so now what we can do is set each of these quantities equal to zero and solve for theta, right? If cosine theta is equal to zero, then we'll have zero times this quantity. So this side of the equation would be equal to zero. And if this quantity is equal to zero, you would have zero times cosine theta, which would also result in zero. So we can set up two different equations. We wanna know when cosine theta is equal to zero and when negative two times sine theta plus one is equal to zero. The values of theta that make these two statements true are going to be locations of horizontal tangent lines. And so if we work with this first equation, we need to ask ourselves for what values of theta is cosine equal to zero. And we're only going to work with values of theta between zero and two pi, right? Because if we go further than two pi, we're just gonna be repeating the same points. Remember that in the polar coordinate system that a full circle is an angle of two pi. So after two pi, you're just gonna be repeating yourself and finding the same points over and over again. All right, so we only need to work between zero and two pi. And so what values of theta between zero and two pi is cosine theta equal to zero? Well, we know that cosine is equal to zero when theta is equal to pi divided by two and three pi divided by two. So those are two values of theta where we could potentially have horizontal tangent lines. I say potentially because if we get one of these same angles when determining the location of vertical tangent lines, meaning that the numerator and denominator are equal to zero at the same value of theta, then we probably do not have a horizontal tangent line. All right, but we'll look at that in a second. We have these two values of theta for now. Now let's solve for theta in this equation. If we add two sine theta to both sides of the equation, we'll have one is equal to positive two times sine theta. And then dividing both sides by two will give us one half is equal to sine theta. And so now you just have to ask yourself for what values of theta between zero and two pi is sine equal to one half. And there's two different angles where sine is equal to one half. It's equal to one half when theta equals pi divided by six and five pi divided by six, all right? So those are two more angles where we might have horizontal tangent lines. Now we do wanna find the points of horizontal and vertical tangency. So we will have to plug these values of theta into our polar equation to get their respective R values, but we'll wait till the end to do that to make sure that those points are actually locations of horizontal and vertical tangent lines. Before we do that, I wanna find our angles of theta for vertical tangency, all right? So let's just move these to the side for now. These are our angles where we will potentially have horizontal tangent lines. And so now let's work on finding our values of theta where we might have vertical tangent lines. All right, so now we're going to set the denominator of our derivative equal to zero, because when the denominator is zero, we will have an undefined value, or in other words, an undefined slope. So we're going to have zero is equal to negative cosine squared theta minus sine theta plus sine squared theta. All right, now solving for theta in this equation is going to be a little bit trickier this time because we don't have any common factors in these three terms that we can pull out to make it easier to solve for theta. But what we can try to do instead is try to have all three of our terms using the same trig function. And what I mean by that is we should try to get all sines or all cosines for these terms. And two of our terms are already working with sine. So if we can rewrite this first term from being cosine to being sine in some way, that might help us be able to solve for theta. And so what we can do is rewrite cosine squared theta using our Pythagorean identity for sine and cosine, right? We know that one is equal to cosine squared theta plus sine squared theta. So if we subtract sine squared theta from both sides of the equation, then one minus sine squared theta is equal to cosine squared theta, all right? So if we replace cosine squared theta with one minus sine squared theta, that might help us be able to solve for theta more easily. So we'll have zero is equal to negative one minus sine squared theta, and then we'll have minus sine theta plus sine squared theta. Okay, so now if we distribute that negative through this quantity, we'll have zero is equal to negative one plus sine squared theta minus sine theta plus sine squared theta. And now we have two like terms, right? We have sine squared theta and sine squared theta. We can add those together to get two sine squared theta. And then I'm also going to reorder our terms and we'll have this, zero is equal to two times sine squared theta minus sine theta 
minus one, all right? So I put this term first, where we combine these two sine squared thetas, and then I wrote negative sine theta next, and then this negative one on the end. And what I hope you realize by doing that is now we have a trinomial that we can factor. If you replace sine with x, we would have 2x squared minus x minus one, right? So if it helps you visualize how to factor this expression, we can briefly let x equal sine theta. And what that will allow us to do is write it like this. We'll have zero is equal to 2x squared minus x minus one. And now we have a trinomial or a quadratic function that we can factor. And doing that will allow us to solve for theta. All right, and so if we were to factor this trinomial, we do have a coefficient of two for our x squared term, so that makes things a little bit more tricky. But since it is a coefficient of two, the only factors of two are one and two. So we know that our two factors are going to look like this. We'll have zero is equal to two x plus or minus some value times x plus or minus some value, right? We're going to have two x and x because one and two are the only factors of two. So we don't really have any other options for that. So now what we can do is a little bit of guess and check to see what should be here and here. And so typically I like to look at the last term. What are the factors of the last term? The factors of negative one are negative one and one. And so some combination of negative one and positive one will probably complete this factorization. All right, so let's try this. Let's try two x minus one and x plus one. Let's see if that works. If we were to multiply these quantities, two x times x would give you two x squared. Then two x times one would be positive two x and then negative one times x would be negative x. So we'd have negative x and positive two x. So that would give us positive x not negative x, so that's not going to work. So let's rewrite that, let's try it the other way. Let's try two x plus one and x minus one. Two x times x is still two x squared. Two x times negative one will be negative two x, and then one times x is positive x. So positive x plus negative two x will be negative x, so that's going to work, because then one times negative one is negative one. All right, and so this is the factorization of this trinomial. Now we just have to substitute back sine theta for x, right? We let x equal sine theta to help us visualize this factorization. So let's do that. We will have zero is equal to two times sine theta plus one and sine theta minus one. And now we can set both of these quantities equal to zero and solve for theta. So we'll have zero is equal to two times sine theta plus one and zero is equal to sine theta minus one. All right, now let's work on this equation first. If we subtract one from both sides of the equation, we'll have negative one is equal to two times sine theta. And then if we divide both sides by two, we'll have negative one half is equal to sine theta. All right, and so now what we have to ask ourselves is what values of theta between zero and two pi make sine equal to negative one half? Now sine is equal to positive one half at pi divided by six and five pi divided by six, and so then sine is equal to negative one half at these two angles, we'll have theta is equal to seven pi divided by six and 11 pi divided by six. All right, so those are the two angles that come from this equation. Now let's look at our second equation. We have sine theta minus one. So if we add one to both sides of the equation, we'll have one is equal to sine theta. And now we just have to ask ourselves for what angles of theta between zero and two pi is sine equal to one and sine is equal to one for one value of theta, which is theta equals pi divided by two. And that's pretty interesting because we also got pi divided by two as an angle for one of our horizontal tangent lines, right? So what we find here is that at pi divided by two, both the numerator and denominator of our derivative are equal to zero. So when that happens, it's most likely the case that at that angle, you don't have either of those tangent lines. You don't have a vertical tangent line or a horizontal tangent line. And if you're familiar with the graph of this polar equation, this right here is a cardioid, right? It's in the form of a lima sun, where the values of A and B are one and one. And so just a quick little graph here, if you're not familiar with graphing polar equations, you can check out one of my previous lessons. The graph is going to look something like this. That's our cardioid. It looks like a heart. And at that angle of pi divided by two, which is this angle right here, this angle, we have a sharp point where the two halves of the cardioid meet. They meet at the origin at that angle of pi divided by two. 
And since we have that sharp point, you can see that we don't have a vertical tangent line or a horizontal tangent line. The slope at that point is undefined, but as you can see, it doesn't make sense to say that there is a vertical tangent line there. And so we're just going to completely eliminate that angle of pi divided by two completely from our answer. That angle is not the location of a horizontal or vertical tangent line. All right, so whenever you have a cardioid and you have that sharp point, you can just eliminate that angle altogether. Okay, and so that takes out one of our angles, but we still have five other angles to work with. We have three pi divided by two, pi divided by six, and five pi divided by six. Those will be the locations of horizontal tangent lines. And then we have seven pi divided by six and 11 pi divided by six, which will be the locations of vertical tangent lines. Now what we have to do is plug those values of theta into our polar equation to get their corresponding R values or the radius values to complete those points of horizontal and vertical tangency. All right, so for horizontal, let's write those over here. Our first angle is three pi divided by two. So if we plug that into our polar equation, we'll have one minus sine of three pi divided by two and sine of three pi divided by two is a negative one. So we'll have one minus negative one, which is two. So our first point will be at two comma three pi divided by two. Then for the next angle, we have pi divided by six. Let's plug that in. We'll have one minus sine of pi divided by six and sine of pi divided by six is one half. So we have one minus one half, which is one half. So our next point will be one half comma pi divided by six. All right, then for our next angle, we have five pi divided by six and sine of five pi divided by six is also one half. So we have one minus one half again, which is also one half. So then our last point of horizontal tangency is one half comma five pi divided by six. Okay, and then for points of vertical tangency, let's find those next. We'll plug seven pi divided by six into this equation. Sine of seven pi divided by six is negative one half. So we'll have one minus negative one half, which is one plus one half, which is three halves. So our first point will be three halves comma seven pi divided by six. And then our second point is also going to have that same value of R. We're going to have three halves and then 11 pi divided by six because sine of 11 pi divided by six is also negative one half. So we have one minus and negative one half or one plus one half, which is three halves. Okay, so now we have all our points of horizontal tangency and all of our points of vertical tangency. We have now completed this example. Okay, so that was a little bit of a lengthy process. Solving for theta can be a little tricky sometimes, but once you're able to find those angles, the rest of the work is pretty simple. Okay, so that's it for this video. If you wanna see some more examples, feel free to check out my examples video that I'll have linked at the end of this video, as well as in the description below. If you have any questions, feel free to leave those in the comments. But if you don't have any questions, this is all I had for now. So I will see you next time.